Good morning. The founding of new settlements is a strange thing. Like if you've ever been to Phoenix and you fly in and you're flying over the desert and you're like, why on earth would people decide to settle here? And then you land and it's 110 degrees outside and it's like, well, fortunately we found this river over here and we burrowed some of the water underground and brought it and here we got a city. Um, or you look at Dubai and the United Arab Emirates. There's no reason why civilization should exist there. Um, but they've got all that oil money, so they could just build a city out of sand, um, and they, you know, they desalinate the waters so they can keep their golf courses nice and green in the desert heat. Um, they've got an indoor ski uh, slope that, of course, you've got to get fresh water for that also uh, from the ocean. Um, they've got all sorts of decadence. They built this tower there that's the tallest tower in the world, um, the Burj Khalif, I think it's called. Um, and from what I've heard, anybody that's been there has said it's just this extremely decadent um, and like worldly society. People drive their Ferraris on the big wide open streets and their airplanes that they have are just amazing. Um, they've got this airline, right? The, uh, really all the Middle Eastern uh, airlines there uh, with all that oil money, they've got these just fantastical airlines where you get to like have your own little apartment in the airplane. They've got showers in the airplanes. They've got all this, you, know, you, you eat your caviar um, while you're on the airplane. It, 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 you know, there's no way that, that Delta can come close to trying to compare with that because we don't have the oil money. Um, and yeah, it's just this like ridiculousness. Um, and so in the first reading in Genesis, right, the people began migrating eastward and they're speaking in the same language and they're like, hey, let's build this giant city out of nothing here in the desert. and Let's build a big tower and we're going to build the tower so high it's going to reach to the heavens. We're going to be able to build something greater than God has done. And we're going to have this kind of like shrine to ourselves. And if we look at modern society, right, we kind of continue to do that. We build these shrines to ourselves. Maybe we don't build big towers, but we like to build our homes or we like to build monuments or something or we like to, uh, you know, just continue to expand the city and have more stores. And, you know, a lot of times the stores are kind of redundant to other stores and they're, they're not really, you know, necessary for civilization, but we have them. You know, you can go to that, um, that place that, sells the really expensive Christmas trees. And it's like, why is there a really expensive artificial Christmas tree shop um, that exists when you can just go outside and cut down a tree and use that? Or you can go to Costco and buy basically the same thing, which was like a third of the price, which is what we did here for Christmas. They were not the front gate trees, they were the Costco trees. Um, but just like the decadence of it. And is it necessary? The Lord came down to the city and the tower that they built, and he said, I not, if now while the people are all speaking the same language, they've started to do this, nothing will later stop them from doing whatever they presume to do. Right? If we think that we can live without God, nothing will stop us from doing whatever we want to do, whether it's good or bad, whether it's harmful to us or not. We'll just presume that because we have this power, we can do it. Right? The great prophet, um, Dr. Ian Malcolm, in Jurassic Park, right, when he's talking about the dinosaurs, he said, um, I'm going to misquote him, so I'm going to try to paraphrase. He said, you know, you had the science and the power to do it, to make dinosaurs, but you never stopped to think if you should, right? Just because we have the ability to do something doesn't mean that we should do it, right? We see that in modern medicine all over the place. Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should do it. Just because sick, twisted doctors that belong in insane asylums or prisons can mutilate the bodies of people to make them look like something that they're not or to make them look like the opposite gender. Doesn't mean we should do it, right? Just because we can um, extract um, uh, uh, eggs from women and fertilize them outside of their body and then put them back inside, leaving the other ones that are fertilized in a freezer, doesn't mean that we should do that, right? Just because we can, you know, do genetic testing on children and see if they have any, you know, birth defects or, you know, God forbid if they're going to be born with Down syndrome. So, you know, just because we can do that doesn't mean that we should and then in turn abort that child, 
Right? Just because we can do something doesn't mean we should. Because then we're building up this kind of idol to ourselves. We're building this tower. We're saying, I don't need God. I can be God. I can play God in my own way. I can decide what happens and when. I can decide what my life looks like. I can decide what the lives of others look like. And then God comes and scatters, right? Because everybody's trying to be in control. Everybody's trying to be in charge. Everybody is trying to have their own reality, right? The problem with um, moral relativism, where, you know, one thing is true for you and another thing is true for me, is that then it's really not true for anybody, right? If I say this ambo here is made out of beautiful walnut, which it is, but you say, no, it's birch. Well, no, you're wrong. Well, but for me, it's birch. It's not walnut. You're wrong, right? If you say that uh, the carpet is, I don't know what color the carpet is, so let's make it easier. If you say that the flooring in here is uh, hardwood, not up here in the sanctuary, but down there, if you say that that is hardwood, you would be wrong because it's carpet, right? Oh, but for me, I think this is hardwood. Well, you are wrong, right? And unfortunately, we live in a time in which we're not allowed to say that. You are wrong. You are misinformed. You are incorrect. Because when we scatter ourselves, and when we start to establish our own reality, chaos ensues. Sinfulness ensues. And so, God is showing us through the through the uh, the Babel the Babel people as they're babbling at each other. They're not the Babylonians. Those are different, or are they? Or did that turn into Babylonian? Uh, don't quote me on that. Never mind. Um, but as God causes these people to babble among themselves and not understand one another, we see this beginning of division that comes from our sinfulness. We see this division that comes from us desiring to build our own world, to make our own heaven to be our own God. And then in the gospel passage, Jesus says, whoever wishes to come after me must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. You must deny yourself. You must take up your cross and you must follow the Lord. That means we have to move away from the big city, right? We have to move away from the big tower. We have to move away from all the decadence. We have to follow Christ where he leads us, into the wilderness, into the desert, into the unknown, out into deep water, where we're uncertain, where we know we can't control anything, where we know that there's no automatic fix. I often in life like to wish that there was a save game function in real life, like on computers, if you hit F7, it saves the game, where you are, like right before you have to jump across something, you hit F7, and then if you fall in, you can hit F6 and revert to your last save. Sometimes I really wish that there is an F7 in life so that before I had to make a difficult decision, I could, I could save game, right? Or before I wanted to say something really edgy, I could save it in case it was too edgy. <clears throat> but if we did that, right, we wouldn't learn. If we did that, we would just kind of continue to make the world around us in our own image and likeness. And so we have to follow Christ. We have to take up our cross. That which is heavy, that which, that which is burdensome, that which will lead us away from the life of this world, will lead us toward death, but ultimately a death that brings about newness of life, as opposed to living for the world in which it's just a sad, lonely death. And dealing with death, it never ceases to amaze me. Sometimes I'll go and give people last rites in their homes and go into these massive houses with, full of decadence and beautiful, ornate woodwork and like custom molding and all the, all the fancy stuff. And you, know, you, you come in and there's this person and they've requested last rites, whether they've been going to church or not, more, more, than, uh, more times than not, they haven't been going to church. And you come in and it's like, you lived your life for all this stuff, and now it's gone. Or rather, it's still here, but you're gone. And so we have to ask ourselves in, lives, in our lives, do we daily take up our crosses? Do we embrace our cross? 
Do we rejoice in our cross? All of us have different crosses. Some of us have more than others. Some of us have heavier crosses than others. Some of us have crosses of sinfulness. Some of us have crosses of despair. Some of us have crosses of uh, hopelessness. Some of us have the crosses of our families, of our relatives, of our children, of our spouses, of our friends. Some of us have the crosses of loneliness. Some of us have the crosses of suffering of any kind. But we recognize that Christ urges us, take it up, embrace it. It will bring you fullness of life. It will bring you newness of life. It will bring you eternal salvation. And so today on this day, let us continue to ask the Lord that he may give us the strength and the grace that we need so that we may daily take up our cross and follow after him.